Good morning. It's Youth Sunday, and uh, we have an opportunity to um, just uh, spend a day today um, worshiping together. We get to listen to Sam, bring the message later on. Um, yes, we've got camp starting up this next week, so uh, for our second set of worship songs, we're going to throw in there a few songs that we do a lot at camp, so hopefully we'll get you guys up and get you going. So let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to start with um, our verse for today, it's First Thessalonians. So we'll say the passage, the verse, and then the passage again. Ready? First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It is well with my soul. In peace like a river attendeth my way. that uh, Jim Eisentrager was uh, bringing the message. And so each morning, um, before our morning devotionals, we have chapel at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, he brought up a book that described the hymn writers and then the hymns that they wrote. 
And this man, um, Norman Spatford, or Horatio Spatford, sorry, um, his family was going across uh, to England from America, and they were going to go over, and he was coming just on the next ship. And uh, his family, his wife and his three daughters, um, were caught in a storm, and their ship went down. And um, they had the coordinates where the ship went down. And uh, so he was just right on the next boat behind him, and he found out about it on the journey across. And as he got to that spot on the ocean, this song came to him. And so he wrote, It is well with my soul. Um, so let's sing that last verse one more time. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. with the wonderful cross.
Let's finish with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's take this chance to find somebody new. Shake some hands, say good morning, just greet each other this morning. All right. As I was saying earlier, we've got uh, we've got camp coming up this next week. We're starting with high school camp. Um, the yes, the staff and the um, counselors and everybody are heading up Saturday. We've got a meeting to kick everything off, and then the campers show up on Sunday. If you have anybody that you know of. Um, that's a sophomore through um, a super senior. So if they've graduated this year and they're heading off to college next year, we'd still love to have them come up to camp. It's not too late to get signed up. Um, the sooner the better, so we know exactly how much food to buy. Um, uh, but if you have somebody in your neighborhood that you think they might like to go to camp, um, you know, we could help them out or you guys could help them out, just get them up there to camp. It's, you just can't recreate that experience. A week of just getting away from all the electronics, spending a week in fellowship, What's that? <laughs> the electronics, they're like, no, it won't happen. Yeah, they do go into, they go into withdrawals when they step off the bus and we take everything. Um, but with, once the shaking stops, they have a good week. Um, but I mean, we have a great time. God, God provides so much amazing opportunities up there. We have the lake right there, so we get to go um, water skiing on the lake. Uh, we get to go rafting down on the Payette River. Um, we have guys that donate their, their boats and the gas and their rafts and stuff. So we get to have an amazing experience of having church everywhere in God's creation. Um, so again, if you guys know of like a, a nephew or a niece or a cousin or anything like that, um, for high school camp this next week and then junior high camps right after that. So that's going into sixth, uh, yeah, sixth grade. Um, they can come up to junior high camp or if they're going sixth into seventh, they can choose to go to one of the junior camps if they're more comfortable that way. But we've just, all the week, all the month of July, we've had opportunities for, for camp, for the kids to come and just enjoy God's creation and just um, experience something completely different. Um, so our missionaries of the week are Bob and Suzette Smith. Um, they are our WANA missionaries. I mean, our CEF missionaries, they, they work with Child Evangelism Fellowship. Um, we get to do a lot of work with them. We've done face painting in the past and training for how to work with, teens, with uh, kids for five-day clubs. 
So if we can get somebody, Paige can take care of that for me. Somebody that would like to send Bob and Suzette a letter, a note of encouragement. We get a hand somewhere. Thank you very much. Our next uh, missionaries of the week um, is Teresa Garcia, and she's got an update right here with her uh, with her envelope. If would like to send her a note of encouragement as well. Do you have anybody that would like to send Teresa a note? Get a hand. There we go. Thank you very much. Oh, the heels are fast, huh? There we go. All right. Let's stand again. You guys are getting your exercises this morning. We're going to read our, our uh, verse of the month together. It's out of First Chronicles. So we'll say, again, the passage together, and then the verse, and then the passage to finish. Ready? Begin. First Chronicles 16, 23 through 24. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. First Chronicles 16, 23 through 24. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> that declare his glory among the nations. Um, you know, that's through singing, but most of all, it's through a lifestyle of worship. Um, we get to do a lot of neat stuff with the teens. <clears throat> um, we do discipleship and we do Sunday school, things like that at, at church. But I think where the most impact is at um, is out in the world. So either inviting their friends to just come hang out with us for a day or go on a hiking trip or go to camp. Um, a few years ago, we were up in the Sawtooth Mountains. We try and take a camping trip each year, and we've done the Sawtooth. We've done the Eagle Cap over in Joseph. If you get a chance, it's beautiful over there. Um, we've done uh, um, up in the Payette National Forest. So one year, we were hiking along a trail in the Sawtooth, and um, we were kind of spread out a little bit. And some of the boys were up front, and I could see them from where I was at. And a guy comes around the corner on a mountain bike, and he's just got tats from head to toe. And um, he stops, and he starts talking to the boys, and the boys were kind of a little nervous. And I, so I started picking up my pace. And uh, so I was just hustling along, and like, all right, what's this guy doing? Tuck, 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 get down there. And uh, we find out um, that uh, he is a um, pastor in Boise, and uh, he'd grown up in the gangs down in California, and he spent um, some hard time in prison in California. He came to know the Lord, and so he felt that God had called him to help teens out of the gangs. And uh, it's quite the ministry because um, what happens is uh, we actually had a neighbor um, that came to us the next day after we met this man on the trail, and he said, hey, I'm trying to get out of gangs, and I just don't know how to do it. And I go, whoo, divine intervention. Ding, ding, ding. We just met somebody the other day. Um, but what happens is um, they try and get out, and the gangs will jump them and, and beat them and cut them. This young man showed up at our door with his arm wide open from a, a knife um, attack, and, uh, and the gangs won't let him out. They'll, they'll beat him. Um, they even said, you know, if you go down to an employer and uh, try and get a job, we'll find out where you work and we'll destroy his place of business. So it's really tough to get out of this, the gang lifestyle. And so um, this gentleman, Peter, he felt his calling was to provide them with work opportunities, um, a safe place to live, and discipleship in Christ so that they could move forward. And here's all of our guys standing there just talking to this guy on the trail. He's like, hey, what are you guys all doing? He's just super friendly. But somebody that you'd look at at the first moment, and you're like, ah, run quickly, 100-pound backpack, not good. Um, but, I mean, we, we ran into Pete out on the trail, and it was just God's divine intervention, divine opportunity, and um, he set that up so that the next gentleman that we met could go to Pete and, and have uh, help the way that God set it up. But you just never know. And so then we get to sit around the campfire and, and talk about who we've met and the struggles we had on the trail. And um, so there's just so many places that we can have church and bring glory to God. Um, let's, uh, let's take our morning um, to the Lord in prayer. Um, there's so many things going on in our world right now that uh, we could look at and just be scared. <laughs> but we have faith that uh, the God of the universe, the God that uh, created it all, is in charge. Let's pray. Precious God, thank you so much for this morning, Lord. Thank you for um, Pastor Shaw and Marilyn. Thank you for their steadfast love for this body and for this community. Lord, we pray for them as they're traveling, that they'll just have a great time um, enjoying fellowship there in England and seeing the places that uh, they were years ago and the people that they were friends with. Um, Lord, we just pray that they would have a, a renewing of their spirits and of their, their bodies as they're away. Lord, we pray for for Boone Presbyterian, um, just an encouragement for that body this morning and for the Oregon Trail Church of God. 
Um, Lord, thank you so much for these bodies of uh, believers here in this area. Lord, we also pray, pray for Deerflat, and thank you for their teaming with us in so many ways um, over the last few months, and we just pray for their camps this summer as well. Lord, we lift up uh, the opportunity to be up in the mountains with the teens and with the young kids this next month. Thank you so much for Warm Lake. Um, Lord, we praise you that if there's, there's 50 or if there's 150, um, that it's exactly who you want up there. And Lord, I pray that um, those that you're putting the calling on their hearts to either be campers or staff, Lord, that we would have soft hearts and willing hearts to go and to uh, dive into the unknown and just see what it is that you have for us. Lord, thank you for this morning, for the teens and for the youth that are giving of their time this morning. Lord, we pray for Sam as he brings the message later, that uh, there will be open ears and open hearts and just an enjoyment of um, hearing you speak this morning through him. In your precious name, amen. You can uh, register your attendance this morning on the slips that are at the edge of the pews. So go ahead and grab those, tear one off, and then send them down in and just keep them ready. There might be something in, this, in the announcements here that you might need to put on there that you're attending or something like that. <clears throat> and then also on the back, um, we love your input. If there's a song that you heard on the radio or you were at somebody else's church and there was a worship music or something like that, um, that you heard that just really uh, ministered to you, could you put that on there? We'd love to, f to get input from the congregation about worship stuff. And then also prayer, prayer requests. Um, Tuesdays we meet as a, a staff and we'd love to pray for you. Special welcome to all our first time guests. Um, if you're here for the first time, please stop at the, the lobby, um, at the desk in the lobby. We have a gift for you. Love to welcome you. The Caldwell Care Center service is today at 3 p.m. Next Sunday, there is a baptism service. It would you li if you would like to be baptized, please mark baptism on that registration slip or speak to one of the pastors. July is camp month at Warm Lake Camp. We're starting with senior high camp next Sunday. Those riding the bus, this is a biggie, those riding the bus need to meet in the church parking lot at 1.30 Final payment for camp must be paid at that time. So all the way up until their little feet step on the bus, you can pay for camp. The bus returns the following Saturday at 1.30, Lord willing, and all tires are intact on the way down. Okay, yes. You are invited to Betty McKee's 90th birthday party on July 4th in the Fellowship Hall from 1 to 5 p.m. Congratulations, Betty. Is she here this morning by any chance? But anyway, Congratulations. Much more information is in the bulletin. Please check it out. I mean, there are just pages of stuff in there about upcoming things. Children ages four through third grade are dismissed for children's church. Good morning, church. Um, I talked to Pastor. I, got, I, I subscribed to a magazine from uh, Institute for Creation Research called Acts and Facts, and uh, I got the June article, June... Uh, edition and I read through it and I immediately called pastor and told him, he says, you need to check out this Sunday school for Sunday school material. It's called uh, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. So he looked it up, looked it online and he immediately uh, ordered the material. And we're going to start the Sunday school class today down the fellowship hall and uh, rather than me go on and try to explain this, I'm going to read this uh, editorial from the executive editor from ICR she can, she can explain it a lot better than I can, and there's going to be a little trailer that Shane's going to show after I get done, after she gets, I get done reading this. It's, uh, are you ready for an adventure? Here, it's here. After 18 months of preparation and detailed production, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis is now available. Producing this unique 12 DVD series has been an incredible adventure for our team at the Institute for Creation Research. We explored the Grand Canyon, uncovered clues at the Dinosaur National Monument, scrutinized the stars at the George Observatory, and glimpsed the wonder of God at Matanuska Glacier in Alaska. We took a film crew along to record the discoveries to share with those who want to hear about the accuracy of what God's Word says about us and our world. While we marvel at God's creation, this series isn't just about spectacular images. Although God's magnificent design and beauty and creation are part of each DVD, our desire for this series is to change lives, to touch you with truths of science and scripture that will re resonate within your soul. We want to equip you to share these creation truths with others. A woman recently said to me, 
This is, the, this is uh, Jamie Durant saying here. A woman recently said to me, biblical creation and evolution are both miraculous. And I said, yes, I can see how you might say that. It certainly takes faith to believe either one. She hesitated because that wasn't where she was going. She meant that the Bible took miraculous faith to believe and evolution displayed miraculous occurrences in science. I knew what she was thinking because I've heard it before. But what she hadn't considered is what this series focuses on. What if science confirms what we find in Scripture? What if science and faith revealed the same truth? Many of us come across those who assume that biblical creation is not compatible with science. They put their faith in speculation about the past and embrace the theory of evolution because they've heard that story a thousand times. When they encounter questions about how we got here, they are willing to believe that we came from ape-like creatures, even though clear observations refute that theory. What scientists have found is that science corroborates the biblical account. We've discovered, as Dr. John Baumgartner says in Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis, the assumptions that scientists have been using for the last 100 years are wrong. Dr. Jake Hebert asks the, criti the crucial question, do the laws of physics and chemistry in our universe permit life to come from non-life? He confidently responds, the answer is no. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen says, by Darwin's own pen, evolution should be rejected. So how do we get here? We investigate that question and unlocking the mysteries of Genesis. How did the universe begin? How did Noah's flood really cover the entire earth? Let's talk about it. Get conversation started. Let's impact our culture. We're talking about speculation about the past. We're not talking about real observations in the present. None of the major steps of evolution have ever been recapitulated in the lab. The biggest problem for evolution is how life got started. What Darwin's really proposing, humans came from some ape-like creature. There's just no evidence to support that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. How do you resolve that paradox? We see repeated instances of corroborating what is in the book of Genesis. Mount St. Helens demonstrates that much geological work can be done in a very short amount of time. We found soft tissue in many different specimens from different fossil sites all over the world. The real issue is, do the laws of physics and chemistry in our universe permit life to come from non-life? And all of our scientific observations are indicating that the answer is no. Darwin gave a test for evolution. He said if you find something, some species, some part of a species out there that you can't build step by tiny step, then my theory is a failure. So by Darwin's own pen, evolution should be rejected. This has profound implications. It means that this assumption that the secular scientists have been using for the last hundred years is wrong. I'm so excited about this. This is this brings us back to our beginnings, the truth of our beginnings. I'm really excited about this. This morning, we're blessed. Uh, Sam's back with us for the summer. Um, he's been uh, studying for the last semester in lovely, warm Chicago. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We told him that it's going to be chilly there, and he experienced a whopper of a winter. Mm. But. Uh, it's not about the climate, it's about the people, and it's yeah. a wonderful school out there, um, and we get to have him back for the summer, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be um, helping at camps, he's been helping um, other churches with some events they've already had, so God's just been using him this summer, so let's uh, give him a warm welcome back, and uh, thankfulness that he's going to open the word this morning. 
Wow, it's good to be back. It's so good to be back. It feels like a long time. It feels like it's been a while, and it really has. So I'm just so blessed and so grateful to be back, um, opening the Word of God for us this morning. And it's always just a privilege to be up here. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting in verse 11, that's where we'll land for today. If you've been with us for the past couple weeks, you'll know we're in the midst of a series called Stories Jesus Told. We're looking at some of the different parables that are unique to the Gospel of Luke and learning from the master storyteller himself, Jesus Christ. And I see as you've found it in your Bible, you've seen the heading, and it is indeed the parable of the prodigal son. Now, this parable poses a significant challenge for those who would, who would presume to preach from this text because it's so darn familiar, isn't it? I mean, this, this parable has absolutely permeated not only church culture, but secular culture as well. I mean, think about books, think about movies, think about music, think about how far-reaching the parable of the prodigal son is. This is truly, I mean, if you asked anybody on the street, I'm sure they could give you a pretty, pretty adept summary of the prodigal son. It's so far-reaching and it has such deep roots. And as we all know that saying, familiarity can breed contempt. Not that we hate this story, but that we've heard it so many times that we feel like there's nothing left to learn from it. But I would propose that we look at this parable maybe again for the first time. And I would ask that as we approach this text that we would just put the preconceptions and the biases that we have about this story out of our minds and, and let Christ just take you up in this story again. Let yourself be enraptured by this story and I see now you're all looking at the top of your notes and thinking that I made a typo in my sermon, the prodigal God. And I want to assure you that's not a typo. Because the word prodigal does not actually mean a wanderer or someone who strays from their home. The word prodigal means someone who spends opulently at great risk to themselves. And this is actually the title of a book by, a, by an amazingly brilliant pastor named Timothy Keller at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York. And it's just a wonderful work. And we'll see as we go into this parable that God is the prodigal here and not the son. Tagline. <laughs> and I'll leave you in suspense as we get into the, into the message here. So just let's, let's approach this for the first time and allow ourselves to be caught up in this story, shall we? Let's begin in verse 11, as Christ begins this story. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the paws the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So we begin with this character that I think we're all familiar with, the younger wicked son. Because we all know the story, we all remember the younger son. This is the bad guy in the story, so to speak. And Jesus opens this story with a fairly unassuming beginning. It's a story about a dad, two sons, and a problem. See, we don't know anything about this family, but we know they're having a problem right now because this younger son has come to his father and said, Father, give me my share of the estate. The younger son is demanding the half of the estate that he is to be owed as his inheritance. He's demanding what he feels like his father owes him. Dad, give me what you owe me. But see, the problem with an inheritance is that the benefactor has to be dead before you can get it. I mean, that's generally the way an inheritance works. So what this son is saying to his pops is, Dad, I wish you'd just up and kick the bucket so I can get your money. I wish you were dead. Your love means less to me than these possessions that I want. Give me what I'm owed. I want your money. I don't care about you. 
Just give me my half of the estate. And I can assure you that many of us, if we asked our fathers the same thing, we would get what we were owed, but it would not be our half of the estate. I see somebody, I hear somebody clapping and they can testify to that truth. I can, I know I can. I would not be getting my half of the estate if I had, if I had the, the, the gall. This is a gutsy kid. He's demanding his half of the estate from his father who's not even dead yet. I mean, we remember the younger son's a bad guy, but we don't remember him being this bad. I mean, he's just a dishonoring son. And you know what he does right when he gets it? Well, first off, why does the father give him the money? And we're not told, which is strange. But dad says, all right, and he divides the estate between the two sons. And immediately, as soon as this kid gets what he wants, he packs it all up, puts it on his back, see you pops, and goes into a far country. Goes away from home puts distance between him and his father. He moves from the farm to Vegas and begins to live a debauched lifestyle. The NASB says loose living, which is a euphemism for every kind of wickedness you can think of. Drunkenness, gambling, prostitution, all of it. You name it. And this younger son is doing it. He's frittering away this money that he stole from his father on reckless, sinful living on this debauched, depraved life, living only for himself. And meanwhile, his father is still at home. He takes that inheritance and spends it on himself. And don't worry if, if you're finding yourself hating the younger son more than you thought you did. Imagine how the original audience felt in this culture of Judaism with honor and the family unit so emphasized. There was probably gnashing of teeth and rage at this son. This son is not just supposed to be a bad character, he's supposed to be a despicable character. One that the audiences just hate and are enraged at. He took his dad's money, he took it and ran away and spent it on himself. And now he's sinning and living this horrid lifestyle and he left his father at home. And he dishonored his father. And so it seems like poetic justice that when he spent his last penny, boom, a famine hits the land. And this son is washed up. He's all alone. He's got no money. He's starving. And he ends up having to feed pigs. He ends up literally in the mire of his own wickedness. And the pig pen. He ends up in a pig pen. Number one, it's sanitarily unclean because pigs are filthy. They're disgusting, filthy animals, and they live in slop, and they live in, in just filth. But number two, think about in Jewish culture, the least clean animal is the pig. He's living in the most foul, unclean situation he can be in. He is just washed up completely, living all alone, starving and destitute in the pig pen, and he's longing to be fed with pig slop. And nobody gave him anything. He's all alone in the mire of his wickedness. And we look at this character and say, oh, what a filthy, disgusting character. What a horrible character. And as I do that, as I look at this younger son and say, oh, that's so gross and it repulses me. I need to turn that and focus it back inside of myself. And look into the depths of my heart and see my own wretched sinfulness and say, that's disgusting. That's filthy. Look at my heart. Look at how I raged that crusade of rebellion against God. I am the younger son. I am the one who rages rebellion against my father. Isaiah 65, verses 2 and 3, God says through the prophet, All day long I have held out my hands to a rebellious and wicked people, a people who walk in their own way, who continually provoke me to my face. That's what my sinfulness does. It's poking the bear. It's provoking God. The inmost parts of my flesh desire 
to live my own life, to run away from home, to run away from the Father and live in that far country in my own sinfulness. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.19, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Do you recognize that about your own heart? Do you recognize the younger son inside of yourself and how horrid it is? It's easy when it's an outside character to reflect that that disgust upon it, but it's a lot harder to turn it back inside of my own heart and say, as Paul did, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? And we receive the reward of sin inside of ourselves. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. I get that reward of sin inside of myself. Sin always leaves me washed up in the mire that I've created. If we make our beds, we've got to sleep in them, as the old saying goes. When we follow our desires, they will always lead to a rebellion against God and a bent towards sin. I love the way Francis Chan puts it. He says, we know sin's not going to fulfill. We know we can't be happy outside of God, but everything in us is pulling that way. Sin is a constant tug at my heart. That younger son is constantly vying for mastery in my life and I've got to look at it and stop loving it and allow it to disgust me we've got to take our sins seriously and recognize that younger son is alive and well in the hearts of our hearts that'd be a pretty just way to end the story wouldn't it The son receives his reward, ends up all alone in the pig pen. It would be a pretty poetic way to end the story. But that's not where the story ends. Let's go to verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And yet I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the younger son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found And they began to celebrate. This young man, living in this pig pen, wakes up one day and says, boy, it would be better to be a slave of my father than to be living like I'm living now. Can you imagine getting to that point where being in slavery, being in servitude is better than where he's at right then? He's filthy, he's stinky, he's hungry, he's poor, and he says, I should just go back to my dad and be a slave. I'll confess to him that I've sinned, but, but it'd be so much better just to be a slave of my father than to be where I'm at right now. So he gets up out of that pig pen. Can you imagine the fear and the anxiety in his heart and his head bowed and his shoulders slumped as he shuffles his way towards home, just gripped with fear? What is my dad going to say to me? I mean, look at what I've done. I took his money. I dishonored him. I spent it all on on reckless living. Maybe he'll take me back as a slave. There's no chance he's coming back as a son. None whatsoever. Because he's basically been disowned from his family. He's he's earned himself a, a disowning stamp from his father. So maybe he can get back and be a slave. But that's even a maybe. And so he shuffles home this just hopeless, sad figure. And yet, while he's still a long way off, just out of eye shot, the father stands at the gate, sees his son, and runs towards him. 
And he sees this son. He doesn't see this filthy, disgusting man, this son who dishonored him. He sees his son that he loves, and he sprints towards him, and he grabs his son, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. Older men in this society don't run for two reasons. Number one, it's undignified. Older men are supposed to walk slowly and solemnly because they're dignified, upstanding members of the community. Secondly, practically, they all wore long robes down that covered their feet. And so this father would have had to grab his robes, pull them up, bearing his legs, which was a social no-no, and run as well. So he hikes up the skirt of his feet and sprints towards his son. This gross, nasty, dishonoring son, and yet this older, dignified father is willing to shame himself and break social tact because he is overcome with love for his child. And the son attempts to humble himself. He tries that line. Father, I've sinned against you as, he's being, as the breath is being squeezed out of him by his father. Dad, I've sinned against you and I'm not worthy to be your son. And the father cuts him off and says, hey, bring the best suit. Bring the best ring. Bring the best shoes. Kill that calf. We're going to party tonight. We're going to have a feast tonight. Because my son was dead and he's alive now. He was lost and now he's found. He showers him with a prodigal feast. God is the father. God is the father in this story. God is the one who sees that lost sinner in all of his filthiness coming home and he sees his child and he says, my child's coming back. And he hikes up his robe and he runs towards his child. He runs towards that sinner who comes home. The gospel stands as a marker where God runs to meet the sinner on the road. The blood of Jesus Christ is God saying, you're coming home and I'm running out to meet you with outstretched arms. And he embraces our child. Everyone has that moment in their life where they wake up and they realize that any peace of God, even punishment from him, would be better than sin. Anything of God would be better than what I'm doing right now. The shock is that when we return, God has no plans of punishing us. God has no plans for this. We come home covered in our own sin and we shuffle down the road and we look and we see a figure racing towards us to embrace us and carry us back home. Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, I tell you the truth, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And again in verse 10, he says, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels over one person who repents. God is the prodigal in this story. He spends his love recklessly at our expense. Even when we've so dishonored him, God is willing to pour out his love and run towards us to take us into his arms and carry us home. He wants to give us a prodigal celebration when we return. That's what happens when you believe in Christ. That's what happens when we accept the gospel. When we come in all of our rags and in all of our tatters and we think, God could never accept me because of what I've done. God can never accept me. He doesn't know where I've been. Sam, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the things that I've done. God can't forgive me. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. This father was willing to run to his dirty pig pen son. How much more will the perfect father run to you when you return home? God's not waiting to punish you. God's not mad at you. God loves you. And he just wants you home. He's saying, come home. All I want is to embrace you and carry you back to where you belong. Our God races down the road to meet you where you're at. That's the gospel. Is God running to you? God is presented as the one who seeks and saves the lost. He searches for his lost child until he finds them. There's nowhere that God won't go to find you. There's nothing that God won't do to draw you back. 
So if that's you, if you're feeling that, know that God is waiting for you to come home. And he just wants to love you. That's all he wants. And that would be a great place to end the story. But that's also not where the story ends, strangely enough. There's a sort of almost appendix to the story, starting in verse 25. And it's a little strange, so let's read it. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf. And because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your commands. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and everything that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate And be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. While the rejoicing party for the lost son is happening, we suddenly remember, oh yeah, there was a second son. And the older son is the one who stayed home, the one who worked hard, who served his father, who honored his father, and it says he's out working in the field, doing what he's been doing, farming probably, And he hears this ruckus going on in the house, just this gigantic party, this opulent celebration. And he goes up and he asks the servant, what's going on in there? Why is my dad throwing a party? And when he discovers what the joy is all about, he becomes livid. He becomes enraged when he finds out, oh, my younger brother came back and that's why my dad is throwing a party? That really makes me mad. That really torques me. I'm upset now. And he demands to know why his good behavior wasn't wasn't rewarded. He says, Pop, I stayed at home. I'm not going in there. I did everything you ever asked of me and you never gave me a young goat. That's the bare minimum of celebrations. You never gave me a tiny goat to celebrate with. But this son of yours comes home who lived this debauched lifestyle, slapped you in the face and took your money, and you roll out the welcome wagon for him. You bring the fattened calf out for him. What's going on, Dad? This isn't very fair. What are you doing? Do you see what his father tells him? His father tells him, Son, you've always been with me. You've always been at my house. And everything that belongs to me belongs to you. You've always been on the estate. You've had everything this whole time. We're celebrating because this son was dead. And now he's alive. And he came back home. Son, you've always been at home. You've always known my love. But this son, he was away. And he's not always had that. And so I'm reminding him again of my love. You know, our hearts are the younger son, but oftentimes we're also the older son, aren't we? The older good son in this context represents the Pharisees and their displeasure with sinners coming into the kingdom of God. At the beginning of chapter 15, The tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners begin to gather around Jesus to hear him preach. And the Pharisees grumble among each other and say, Who is this guy who hangs out with sinners? Who are these people that Christ chooses to receive and eat with them? Who are these people? Why doesn't he want us to come around? We're the good guys. And that's why Jesus starts telling these stories as a response to them. And sometimes we are the older son. We see sinners come into the kingdom of God and we read verses like this about God celebrating over sinners who come in and say, gee, why doesn't God reward me more? Look at all these good things I've done for God. Why doesn't he reward my good deeds? Why does he reward the things that I do? I'm feeling a little underappreciated here right now. God's celebrating over sinners, but he doesn't celebrate over the fact that I tithe 
or that I, that I witness, that I do all these things, I'm a little angry, God. I'm a little disappointed. And God says to us, son, daughter, you're a part of my family. You're a part of my kingdom. You have all of me. I love you infinitely. James 1.17, James says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. He's saying, my children, you've got everything. You're already in the family. You're doing these things because you love me. And yet, you're displeased when another lost child comes home? I can be pretty petty sometimes. I think we can, too. We can be petty. We can say, God should reward me because I'm doing these nice things. God should reward me because I'm doing these things. You're already in God's family. We have everything that God wants to give us. We have all of God's love. We have eternal life. What more do you want? A Ferrari? What more can God possibly give you? And yet we would have the goal to be displeased when someone comes into the kingdom and it says God celebrates over him? How tacky can we be? Boy, I can be tacky sometimes. Do you know why God celebrates so much over a sinner? I read a book at Moody by Mark Cahill called The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. Phenomenal book. Phenomenal book. I would encourage you all to read it. But Mark says this at the beginning of his book. He says, you can praise God in heaven. You can read your Bible in heaven. You can pray in heaven. You can do all these things in heaven. You know the one thing you can't do in heaven? Witness. Because it's too late. That's why God rejoices over the sinner. You have all eternity to do righteous deeds in the kingdom of God. The sinner has one shot to get in. That's why God rejoices so much, is because they took their one chance to get into the kingdom. They've got a short time. That's why Jesus said, the time is short. The harvest is plentiful. It's a short time. We've got to get out there. The sinner's got maybe a hundred years at best to come into the kingdom of God. We've got all of eternity to praise him and to read our Bibles. That's why God rejoices over the sinner and feasts over them and has a prodigal celebration over them is because these sinners get their lifetime to repent and that's it. That's why the gospel is a cause worth celebrating. Not that all these things are bad. Please don't misunderstand me. Worshiping God is amazing. Reading the word is amazing. All of these things are wonderful, but that's why the gospel gets top priority. It's because there's an eternal decision to be made. And once you die, as the writer of Hebrews said, is appointed for man to die once and then face judgment. That's why God rejoices over the sinner who comes home. As the older son, we are called to share the heart of God for the lost sinner. I'd like to read some verses from, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that I, think, that I think sum this up so well. Starting in verse 16, Paul writes this. He says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the heart we're called to have for the lost sinner, is to be a representative of Christ and call those younger sons in from the pig pen, in from the far country, and say, God wants to run and embrace you. Not to, not to be disgusted and angered when we, when we feel slighted, but to bring lost sinners into the kingdom of God as God is calling, O oh sinner, come home. God just wants us to come home. And as the older sons, as those in the family, we're called to have that heart for the lost sinner. Well, what are the lessons we can learn from this story? What are the lessons for us? 
By the way, that's a pretty powerful story, isn't it? As I was rereading through it and preparing this, I didn't remember this story touching me so much, touching me so powerfully and being so full of meaning and really showing us the heart of God. It's familiar, but it's an incredible story. I think the first lesson we got to learn is that we got to recognize that younger son inside of us. Our natural bent to rebel against God is something that totally consumes us. And unless we let the Holy Spirit wage that war inside of us, kick that younger son out, it's always going to come back up and lead us away from God. We've got to let the Holy Spirit do his work of cleaning us and kicking that younger son out of our hearts. Secondly, for all of us who are wandering or have wandered, or even I think this story applies if we've just sinned once. God is waiting for you to return. So even if you're in the family of God and you just sin, know that every time we repent and come back, God is willing to welcome us with open arms. And if you're wandering from God, he wants you to come home. If you have wandered and come home, then you know what that's like. And God just wraps you in his arms. God wants to welcome you home with a prodigal celebration. He's going to roll out the red carpet for you when you come home because he's going to be so excited that you came back. When tempted to tout our deeds and years of faithful service above the repentant sinner, we got to remember that the gospel has priority on this earth because of the limited time we have. Capture that heart of God for the lost sinner in your own. And remember how important the gospel is in this life. Finally, above all, we've got to never forget the extravagant love of the Father for his children. There's a story that's used as an illustration for the prodigal son, and it tells of an itinerant preacher who would travel on the trains around preaching in different cities. And one time, He was traveling to a particular town and he was sitting on the train and he noticed a young man pacing. He would get up and he would pace and just look nervously and and then he would sit back down. Then he'd get up and, and, and pace and just looking quite worried and quite anxious. And so this preacher comes up to him and says, son, what, what's going on? And this man just lays his soul out and says, you know, I used to fight with my dad a lot. And we would fight and fight. And one time we had this huge argument. And I said, well, why don't I just leave? And I left home and ran away and went to a city pretty far away from home. And I fell in with a bad crowd. And I ended up robbing a liquor store and spent some some time in prison. And just before I got out of prison, I started thinking about how nice it would be to go back home. And I wrote to my parents and I said, Ma, Pa, I know I've disappointed you, and I know you could never welcome me back, but I'm passing through the town, and if you want me back, find something and tie, tie it white. Tie something white to the tree outside my property, because I know I can see it from the train tracks, and, and just tie something on there. If you don't, I'll never come back home, because I know you won't want me. But if you want me to come back home, just tie something white. And he said, I wrote that letter, and now I'm coming home, and, and I'm just so nervous. What if my parents don't want me back? And the preacher said, well, well, let's pray and let's watch. And so they get closer and closer to the town, and now the preacher is getting anxious. He's praying. He's saying, God, please let something be white out on that tree. Please let this child be welcomed back home. And, and he's pressing his face to the glass, and the son finally says, it's just around this corner. Please let there be something. And the preacher said, as he got around the corner, he couldn't believe what he saw. This couple had emptied everything white in their house. Underwear, socks, tablecloths, linens. The tree was completely white. This family tied everything they had as if they were begging their son, come home. The tree was white and the son looked at it and he couldn't believe his eyes. He grabbed his suitcase and leapt off the train. And the preacher said the last thing he saw was this older couple welcoming their son into the house. And he said, that's what God does for you with the gospel. God empties his linen closets and ties everything white to the tree and just says, come home. Come home. 
that white tree is there. That father is standing at the gate. Come home. Let's pray. Lord, you move us and you break us in so many ways, God. We can't fathom the love that you have for us and the, and the way you just want us to come home. And I pray that if there are any of us wandering, if there are any of us straying from you, that you would just take us back. And that if there is anyone who feels like they can't come home, to know that your love is infinite and wide and deep. And you're waiting just to embrace us with open arms, God. Thank you for your reckless love for the sinner and that you, God, are the prodigal one who spends your love and will not let us go. Thank you. Amen. Working with teens, um, you get to see so many um, life choices right after they graduate. You know, they can either become a different person when they go away to college, or they can um, establish their faith and become stronger. Um, but uh, what a great and wonderful God we serve, that he opens his arms and just welcomes us back in. Hosanna. See the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing. The people sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest See a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and see we're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Heal my heart, heal my heart and make it clean. To the things unseen Show me how to love like you Have loved me Break my heart for what breaks yours Everything I am for your kingdom's cause As I walk from earth into Eternity Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna 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 in the highest
Amen. All right, now it's time to uh, pull up that robe, show a little leg, get a little socially unacceptable for just a little bit here. These are some of the songs we do up at camp, and uh, there's some clapping involved, there's some motions, all right? Time to shake it up a little bit, get, help get these teens in the, in the mood for camp. All right, so the ladies over here are going to be helping you with the motions. It's all right. Have a little fun with it. Here we go. with no voices. It's good. All right, a couple more fun ones. Every move I make. Now this one, it's got some very spiritual woo-woos in there. God says, make a joyful noise. Lift the roof. Yes, yes. We're, we're skipping the very, very spiritual la-las for today. Okay, yes. All right. <laughs> but there's some woo-woos in there. So it's every move I make, I make in you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Woo-woo. Oh, don't let the teens beat you either. Beat them down. Beat them out. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. All right, here we go. Hey! 
Yes. And we do this at 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh. Okay, we're going to finish with Rise and Sing. Here we go. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's my prayer for you this morning. Check out that Sunday school class downstairs, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Looks like it's going to be pretty cool, and I hope your day is blessed. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. And also, um, from uh, the...
Jake and Nikki Farmer wedding. We've got some cake in the, the library, so make sure you get back there and uh, don't leave a crumb. <laughs>